All right, I'm going to go over to Philippians chapter 2 tonight. Hopefully it'll be a blessing for us to meditate on a passage that really is one of those stellar passages in the Bible. So for a little study for us tonight, I want to encourage you to look at that with me. Chapter 2, um, you're going to notice something changes from chapter 1 to chapter 2. Chapter 1 was a lot about Paul bragging on those people. He praised the Lord for them in their fellowship of the gospel, talked about the furtherance of the gospel, and really uh, championed the faith of the gospel. said, you know, you've got to take the gospel and you've got to take it with you, and, and, the, and, and that they were going to have to suffer. Part of the faith of the gospel might lead certain ones into a, a deep degree of suffering. When you come to chapter 2, however, we did see some uh, hints at the underlying problem back in Philippi. Um, Euodius and Syntyche in chapter 4 are not getting along. And so Paul is really grateful for the gift that the folks had sent him. However, it breaks his heart when the church is fractured. Um, you guys remember when Solomon died and Rehoboam, his son, became king in his place. And Jeroboam was also in the wings. He was not related to the kingly line. But you recall that after David died, that the uh, people said, hey, uh, can you, Rehoboam, lighten our load? And he asked the older men, what should we do? And they said, you know, yeah, you, you need to lighten their load. It'd be good. They worked really hard for your dad, and a lot of things that were accomplished, and probably a time to just enjoy the, the great days that are ahead in peace and prosperity. And then he asked his buddies, who were about his age, and they all said, no, man, you need to drive these people. That's how it's done. And he went with the, with the younger crowd. Well, it split the kingdom. And, you know, we live in a day where, where Christianity is fractured, I mean, big time. We saw in chapter 1 that there was that concept of Christ being preached out of envy, you know, and strife and trying to hurt me. They think they're doing it to add affliction to my bonds. And, and yet others for love and people were becoming bold. And he said, I praise God for the buzz. You know, it's everywhere. They're talking about Jesus. That's great. I'm going to go with that. Um, and God will take care of those details. But now, we have a very fragmented Christianity across the board, it seems. I mean, this is 2,000 years later. At this point, however, one church fracturing with a couple people having some dissonance, it was really burdensome to the, to the apostle. The people at Philippi were really near and dear to his heart. And so I want you to see as we look at verse 1 that he's really kind of making an appeal uh, more not talking about them as much as he's talking about himself. He's using himself as a motivation for them to get things worked out. Get things worked out. Look, says, look at verse 1. It says, if there, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy. You might circle the word my. Because he's saying, I'm going to ask you to do something that might not be. Now, sometimes you'd like for your kids to do something for you because, you, you know, I'm not going to ask you much. I, you're grown up or whatever, and you say, I just really would, would like it if you do this for me. Well, Paul is using that appeal. Now, what he's going to ask them to do is become unified again because they've lost that. Um, Amos, it is, it says, how can two walk together except they be agreed? Um, and yet today, a lot of people are walking together without being agreed. And that's not to be preferred. God wants truth in his church. The church is the pillar and ground of the truth. So if you compromise on doctrine, vital doctrines at that, and the relationships, which right now I'm in a bit of a quandary because what's happening is, is that we're being told not to gather in our country. And yet, the Bible says greet one another with a holy kiss. Now obviously that's sort of a... Uh, Italian kind of thing, the guys kissing the guys on the cheek as they meet and they hug. Handshakes we've come to know very closely, and yet they're saying don't gather, don't touch one another. You know, uh, We know that if a child is born preemie especially, the first thing they really are made to thrive by is skin-to-skin -skin contact. There has to be that. And we are used to being up close to each other, and yet because there's a a pervasive lie saying, don't do those things. It, it kind of, it, it, it makes us say, am I going to listen to Jesus or am I going to listen to the world? 
Now, I'm just saying, this is the kind of stuff that people who are in my position are dealing with, and maybe employers in offices or whatever, they're asking themselves, and they're not taking into account what Jesus said. But notice, uh, I have noticed even today, on Sandy Rio, she talked about um, isolation was one of the ways that they tortured people in, in prison. And I thought that's an interesting point as well. So Paul is dealing with a fractured church. And even though it's not standing off because of some kind of a, what we might call, you know, unseen enemy or whatever, they are because of that air in the room. And it's, 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 it's making everything icky. And I think what we have to be mindful of is that in this day, we just have to be what God wants us to be. If somebody's sick, they should stay home. That's always been true. <laughs> somebody comes home with a cold and runny nose and they know they're coughing and sneezing, typically they just stay home. But they're making this bigger than life. And so when I see this, I see him saying things like love. I see him saying things like comfort. I see him saying things like compassion, which is bowels and mercies. I see him talking about real feelings. And it's almost like we're being told to rein in our feelings right now. And that's hard, especially you, know, you get to the grandparent stage. A lot of grandparents are you know, struggling. I haven't seen their grandkids, and they, they really want to see them. They're driving by, and they're waving. And it's not the same. It's not the same on a screen. We need to be together. And that's what God says. He says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. And so much more as you see the day approaching. Now, I'm seeing the day approaching pretty quickly. So he says it's getting down to it, and you're saying stay away? No, that's how, that's how the devil fragments. And I mentioned Rehoboam and Jeroboam because God said, this thing is from me. Okay, in that split, there was something there. There's nothing wrong with denominational nuances, but when it gets to be doctrinal and, and severe, that's a problem. And that's where we are today. We have many denominations, and sometimes they're not even, they're believing in work salvation versus grace. That, those are two different things. One is sort of like Judaism, and that over against what we would call uh, the true way of Christ that was left for the apostles to champion. And it became a threat, even in those early days. But even a dissonance among believers can be a problem, and it can break the, the, the rhythm and, and the flow and the blessing of the Lord. And so he says, if there be any consolation in Christ. Now this word is the word paraklesis. It means to call alongside. This is a word that's often encouragement, comfort. Uh, here it's, called, it's translated consolation. And it, it means to come alongside. Uh, I, I love the fact that the comforter is the parakaleo, which is to be the call alongside him. He's the advocate, he's the one who's called alongside, and you see an advocate in a courtroom drama when he's standing next to his, you know, client. Jesus stands next to us, the Holy Spirit stands next to us, and I find that to be very consoling, that I'm not standing there alone, that somebody's interceding for me. But he says, if there's any consolation in Christ, what's he saying? He's saying, you know, listen, you know that Jesus has been there for you. Think about this. He's saying if this is something we can all agree on, that there is consolation in Christ, that he does parakaleo you, that he does come right up and stand next to you, if there be any of that, fulfill you my joy. That's the first thing. Now, that's a pretty big deal. Jesus coming near? Guess what? If we have sin in our lives, <laughs> we might be a little bit kind of moving, if, especially if we've chosen it and we've what? Not forgiving one another? Remember, if you forgive not those who trespass against you, neither will your Father forgive you. Why? Because God doesn't forgive? No. We're complete in Christ, but He can't forgive us if we're not asking Him to. So we walk around in a frump. And that's why after the Lord's Prayer is first introduced, He says, for if you forgive not those that sin against you or trespass against you, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. You remember in the Old Testament where it says, if, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me? doesn't mean he can't hear. <laughs> he can hear, but he won't. Because it's hard to pray when there's sin in the camp. Just like Achan. They couldn't get any victory when Achan took the unclean thing. Okay? So he says, if there be any consolation in Christ. Has Christ ever been anything to you? Is what he's kind of saying. If you know him, you know he's near. He is my shepherd. Thou art with me. Those kind of things. He says, if there be any consolation in Christ. And part of the things he, he does next is he ramps that up a little bit. He says, if there be any comfort of love. This is the word paramuthian. 
This is an interesting word, paramuthian. It really only occurs right here. This is the only place it appears in the Bible. Uh, you might have thought, reading it cold and knowing a little bit of the j jargon from preachers talking about, you know, paracle, oh, it might be that, but that's not paramuthian. It means, the word muthian is the word myth. It means fables or stories. But it, what it really means here is it means stories that you have about the consolation of Christ. You ever shared a testimony? Have you ever said, man, you should have seen, man, it was so neat today. This thing just exactly happened the way that I could have never scripted it. God did that. I told you guys about the time my car broke down. My buddy came. We drove around for an hour and a half, came back. My car rose, started again. I never had to have anything done to it. It was like, I broke down for that. That's a comfort, a paramuthian of love. God loved Chuck. God did something in my life to get to Chuck. Right now I'm working with a guy who had five preachers in his childhood that were his uncles and brother-in-laws and they sang in a gospel quartet. They'd come over and sing at events. And him and I, we've been together for three weeks. Just him and I said, do you, do you have any idea why you're stuck with a Baptist preacher for, the next, for these last three weeks? Because he's been talking about it. He's not right with the Lord. He might be saved. The stories he tells me of what's happened in his life. But my point is, is that God never lets us go. This guy is 55 years old, and yet his stories make me think he's being chastened, and he's being chased, and I mean, the idea of discipline, you know? He's got a daughter, and we talk, and I share my testimony. He says, man, I had something exactly like that happen. He'll tell me, I'm like, whoa, and we laugh because he's getting a dose of Jesus by going through the Parabutheans, his stories. Stories of what? Love. Any comfort of love? you have any paramuthians of love? Have you ever seen him show up? The Bible says if there be any fellowship of the Spirit. You see how personal this is? Fellowship of the Spirit. Paracoletlo, he's called alongside to help. There's stories of love. There's the Holy Spirit's comfort. He says if there be any fellowship of the Spirit. And the reason he says this is because these are the things that are up, up for grabs. These are the things that are volatile. Um... You know, I, I'm trying to think, of it's just the idea of something very, very um, fragile. You know, there's that fragility of, of, of maybe life, a little chick or whatever, you know. Maybe you remember uh, the storyline of, of Mice and Men, the big guy, and he killed a little bunny or something, and it was an accident, and later in the story, he hurts a little girl, and it was an accident, and his buddy, you know, and he, he had to deal with this, and it was awful. And my point is, is that you're a steward of your relationship with God. And they are a steward not only of their relationship with God, but listen, how that relationship impacts the rest of the body of Christ. Do you realize what has happened in our recent days? What we have had happen right now in our country over the past 10 years probably, is we've had an assault on the family with the uh, Obergefell decision. You could take that and extend it back to abortion because a lot of women's hearts are really ripped and hurt and they don't know forgiveness is available. I mean, it's hard to deal with that. And if you don't know Jesus, man, if you don't know his word, it's going to be hard to think straight when you really get a clue. You're going to think everybody's against you. No, no, Jesus loves us all. He can forgive, right? But the family, the family has been attacked. Obergefell makes marriage not all that big of a deal. It's just an agreement. We've had our faith attacked because of what's happening now is we're being told to stand outside. Think of this. The vast majority of the people who go to church in our day are older people. Any, any poll that's been done in recent days will tell you it's above 50 years and older. Think about that. And the people who are most vulnerable to coronavirus right now are over 50. And that's the people who go to church. I can't help but think of how when uh, Jim and Helen Burford were coming, they, they were feeble, struggled to walk and be comfortable. And they're out knocking on doors for crying out loud. Now, they didn't walk from house to house. They pulled their car into a driveway. One of them went up to the door. If something happened, the other one would come up. And then they would get in their car and they'd go to the next house. It was, it was very challenging, humbling, and a delightful thing to witness. But that was the measure of their commitment. Young people today are not as committed to the, that kind of Christian, Christian, Christendom. They're more committed to the entertainment variety. And I don't, that's not their fault. They've been given that. We as parents, maybe, we taught them to entertain themselves. They never knew how to get off of the nook. Okay, <laughs> give me a pacifier. I need a pacifier all the time. 
But the thing is, real serious Christendom is now coming into its own. A lot of young people are beginning to say, something's weird. Something evil this way comes. Okay, they're feeling, and they're feeling that. Well, we have a lot of relationship that's fragile, but not only is our faith under attack in our family, but also our freedoms. So our country has got a trifecta of really dangerous things, and a lot of it has to do with divide and conquer. And what we see Paul doing here is he says, you need to think about how close this relationship you have with the Lord is because you are a steward of that. And as long as you're in fellowship with him, there will be harmony in the body of Christ. But as with any kind of uh, maybe uh, cancer that gets inside of the body, it can take all of the energy from everything else. And that's kind of what happens in chapter 4. He addresses it first uh, face on. He says, if any of these things, he says, if any bowels and mercies, it, that's the actual full expression of, uh, of salvation. Bowels and mercies has to do with how I look at other people. Do I have pity and mercy on you? Even if you hurt me, do I really look at you with that desire to forgive because I realize, you know, uh, life is hard. And you're, you're, you're a fellow struggle. You're not, a, you know, you're not perfect. I'm not perfect. Um, and I have compassion. The lost people. I have compassion. It's really a fine line we walk today because, you know, we're all reigning like Solomon kings, you know, because we've had so much. But when we then talk about people who are in, get involved in sin, we, we lose that sense of stewardship. We're like, they do this, so therefore they're bad. But really, they're lost and they're doing bad. And that's what, bad, bad. that's what lost people do. We all were lost at one time. And we remember when we were lost and we had our sins. And, and we have to kind of be careful. And I find that many times I have to go back to guys I've talked to on the job. And I've had to say, no, just I want you to know I'm not against those people. I said, and I try to walk that back because I realize my passion can sometimes come across to untutored ears as being, you know, antagonistic, and I don't want that. And we don't want that. And I, have, I, have, I feel bad about that. That's bowels and compassion. My stomach hurts, as it were. And bowels, the idea of that, that, oh, that ache in your gut that you feel like you've, you've done something you shouldn't have, and you've missed an opportunity. He says, if any of these things exist in you, it's almost like he's saying, if you're saved, <laughs> if, because these are the earmarks, if you're really born again, if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, and uh, you feel anything for me over here in jail, Bowels and compassions, how he ended it up. Bowels and mercies. He says, I want you to fulfill my joy. You wanted to be a blessing to me. You wanted to buoy up my spirit. He says, you wanted to do that. He says, so if you want to do that, here's how you can really do that. You know, I really don't need a basket. I don't need a care package. I don't need money. What I need is to know that y'all are okay. Now, I think the only way we can really appreciate this is when we look at people we love, like our children or grandchildren or people that are in our, in our, in our heart, knit there, uh, when we see them struggling. It just, it, it's all you think about. I mean, it's, I'm talking big struggles, not the little stuff, but everybody's got little stuff. You know, we all got that. But I'm talking about where you see them really on the edge of making a really bad decision. I mean, it'll keep you up at night. I mean, that's kind of how it is. This is what's happening to Paul. Paul's in prison and he knows there's a, a, a rift in the middle of the Philippian church. And that they're really great folks. They're givers. They love him. They love the people that in Jerusalem they gave that offering. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, 9, you know, talks about the unspeakable gift of giving, the grace of giving, and how we have the opportunity to do something even when we're poor. We can give out of our poverty. God sees it. These were good people. But now they're walking with a limp. They've got they've been a hamstrung. He says, but you can fulfill my joy. How? That you be like-minded. Now notice the stress upon mind. He says, like-minded. That you be of one mind at the end of verse 2. He says in verse 3, in lowliness of mind. He says in verse 5, let this mind. Why mind? Because we have to think things through sometimes. There are people who say that some people think first, then feel, then act. Some people act, then think, then feel. And they get all this TFA, AFT, all that, and they get those in order. But the fact is, is that real repentance comes out of your mind. It means a change of mind. When things really change in your mind, they will change in your shoe leather. 
When you really believe that something you have to do needs to be done, you're going to get up and start walking to the door and go get it done. Um, if you thought you left your car running right now, your mind played with you for a minute, and, you thought, well, and we've all been there. Left my keys in my car. Left my key car running. Whatever. Eventually it nags at you to where you finally get up and go. That's the way we're wired. And so even though there is an emotional component, and there should be in our faith, and sometimes people, you know, they, they check out of the thinking thing. They won't even think about thinking. They're not just, you know, I'm, I'm just so enthralled. The music was so wonderful. We worshipped it today because we sang until we were in tears. Well, that may be once in a blue moon, but you can't live on that. That's like saccharine, okay? It's not real, and it's not going to be anything that can really nur nur nurture your soul. What we need is doctrine. What we need is depth. We need our roots to go deep. The Bible says the man who's really in love with the Lord meditates in his word day and night. And his, his delight is in the law of the Lord. And, and he's like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Why? Because he's getting something, man. And then when a song comes around that just takes you on up to the third heaven, that's okay. But many people start with, I got this chill from this song. And they're going after it every time they turn around. And that's all they know. And that's sort of the devil's trade-off. He hates the fact they enjoy the songs, and maybe they even the songs glorify Christ, but if it's all about the singing, that is not what it's about. See, that should proceed from a devoted heart. In fact, the Bible doesn't even talk much about singing except singing and making melody in your heart in the New Testament. Oh, yes, we have the book of Psalms. That's the argument. And yes, we do. But notice Jesus is only said to have sung one time in the New Testament. It was right before he was crucified. And you know why he's saying it? It was to buoy up his spirit and to remind himself of some very basic things. And he was probably singing the Psalms of Ascent. Strap the, strap the sacrifice to the altar. You know, bind it to the altar. These are some things. That, and that's him. And he's reminding himself, you know. And even in Psalms and hymns, many times, it's a, it's a recounting of Scripture. So I say to you, he says, if you want to fulfill my joy, I need you to be the, of like mind, one mind. I need you to think about being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord. See how important that is? He's just really trying to get them past being uh, dissonant. It's kind of funny. We've all been there where in, a, in maybe a home situation, we all make fun of the years past where everybody's kind of got a little higher tone in the house because things are a little heated. And somebody calls and they say, hello, you know, they've got a real nice voice. Oh, yeah, how are you? You know, and they're pretending immediately. It's like switch turned on. And we laugh about it. But this is what's going on here. They sent a, they sent a, pre, a, a care package to Paul and there was sour grapes all around. You know, there was these two people against, you know, having a rift, and then other people were thinking, man, they should get along, and, you know, I agree with Sintiki, well, I think it's, you know, Euodius, oh, man, you know, and you can just see how everybody's just kind of bummed out, you know, it's kind of like listening to news all day, <laughs> you know, when you look outside on a sunny day, Lynn and I were talking about that today, we went out, and it's like pretty out there, but it's like, oh, man, heard too much, you know, today of some things, so. You see that? Fulfill ye my joy. How can you do that? How can you do that? By being of one mind. Now how can you do that? By being committed to a similar standard. You see, it's not about you. And it's not about me. It's about Jesus. It's always about Jesus. And that's what the doctrine does. If I were to outline this chapter for you, uh, at least this section, I would tell you he's calling them to unity. That's the first thing. We see it all over the place. But next he's going to call them to humility, and then he's going to call them to simplicity. Look what he says. He says in verse 3, after he's called them to one, oneness of mind and heart and soul and all that, he says, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. See? See, he's talking to them about, uh, he's talking about strife, vainglory, but in lowliness of mind. That's humility. He says, don't be all about electioneering and putting yourself forth and thinking you've got a right to this or a right to that. You know, it's hard because... It's very easy for us to get caught up in, you know, self-promotion. Boy, they didn't recognize me. Nobody noticed. And folks, that's what Jesus went through. He was, you know, he was on this earth for three years. He's healing everybody. And the disciples are constantly, you know, talking about, which one of us is greatest? Who thinks he's going to be the greatest? Jesus is here and he's pouring out. He's giving them the power to heal. He let Peter walk on water. He gave them promises of a resurrection, of a kingdom. And all they can think about is themselves. 
Now, the only thing you can do with that is say, wait a minute, that was pre-resurrection, okay? Nobody had resurrected yet. They were walking in the flesh. Peter denied Jesus walking in the flesh, but some 50 days later, what did he do? <laughs> he got up and preached the sermon on Pentecost. He was filled with the Spirit. You couldn't shut him down, man. This guy was filled with God. We have that helper in us. He's, he's called such, the helper, the comforter, the paraclete, uh, the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says, don't go there in vain glory and strength. If you have that going, he's going to, don't let anything be done. Now, be done is, is italicized. It means it's trying to give the sense, the idea. So we don't want to amplify it too much. So if we take them out, read it this way. Nothing through strife. Nothing through strife. It's almost like he's saying, stop and sit out. You know, don't do anything. Just stop and sit out. Nothing through strife. Don't ever go at somebody because that's not going to help. What does it say in James? The wrath of man cannot accomplish the purposes of God, right? You can't do that. God, God doesn't come and force us and we aren't to force other people. And as I look at this, he's saying nothing through strife or vain glory, which is me promoting me. And boy, I like to be noticed and stroked and told nice things, but you know, you have to get over that. Because frankly, just like I told you, a guy comes up to me at the end of a message and says, yeah, I just didn't agree with anything you just said. And I'm like, well, you know, I like what one guy said after a message, said, you know what, this week, Adrian Rogers preached on that very sermon, and it was great. <laughs> you, know, you know, you just can't even worry about that. You just give them the word of God and move on. And one guy said that was a very warm message. Preacher looked up the word warm, which is not so hot. So he thought, you know, he just took it and just went with that. So. The preacher's take it, man. It's like a one-two punch because, folks, we are all like that. And we have to go to the point where, like Jesus, we were willing to be wounded, be broken bread and poured out wine for others. We can't be looking for the stroke and looking for the attaboy because God's the one who's going to give that. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. He's going to say, enter thou into the joy of the, of the Lord. And I love that because we saw uh, that this past week. It's like, Wait a minute, what about the kingdom? He said, oh, enter into the joy of the kingdom, the prepared for you. But the joy of the Lord, think about that. There is something very dynamic about it. Enter into the joy of the Lord. You see, the Bible says in God's presence is fullness of joy. He's there. And the Bible says that the, we will come forth with peace and come forth with something of singing, you know. The mountains and the trees will break forth before you and all the trees of the field will clap, clap their hands. We're going to come with ever an everlasting joy will be upon our brow. And I kind of butchered that, but you recognized it anyway. It's really true that when he comes, there's going to be everlasting joy upon our brow. And that's where we're going to get the attaboy. That's when we're going to get the recognition. That's where the rewards are coming. He says, behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. I've got a reward for you. And I'm like, that, that's nice to look forward to. So if we understand you don't get paid till payday, <laughs> And we just do the work as best we can now, knowing that we're kind of working on commission, right? We do more, we get more, you know, the Lord's going to bless us, and it doesn't mean we get more than somebody else. It means that our joy goes higher. And even if the more means going into affliction, what did Paul say? I count the sufferings of this present time not be worthy to be compared to the glory that will be revealed within us. In fact, that it works a far greater way to so we begin to really take God in his word, and we can get through pretty much anything. These two people, they're having problems. Everybody else is getting some on them. It's, it's splattering other people. Remember, the fiery darts of the wicked one, they explode, they, they explode with the, uh, the asphalt that's on fire. It splatters other people. Other people get burnt. That's what's going on here. And he says, listen, he says, I need you to uh, do everything by lowliness of mind, verse 3. And he says, let each esteem others better than themselves. Now, I think it's very interesting for us. We have to look at this word better. The word better is interesting because it just, it's like they say a cat is more enjoying the, the, you know, the scratches if it's going with the hair, not against the hair. <laughs> Some people like to play and the cat's like, come on, come on. Yeah, you, you know what to do. You know what to do. You know, scratch the hair with the hair, go the right way, and the cat will enjoy it. But here's what I'm saying. He's looking at this and he's saying better, and that doesn't, feel right to us, better, they're better than me? Well, let me give you a couple of things uh, where this word is used. Romans 13, 1 says, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. Higher powers. That's the word for better. Here, Philippians 3, 8 says, yea, doubtless I count all things lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. 
excellency is the word. Another place you are familiar with, 1 Peter 2, 13, submit yourselves to every ordinance of men for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme. Now, if you take that word uh, better out and you put supreme, uh, you know, higher or whatever, what he's saying is think more about that. Think more about that. Remember what we said about humility? It's not thinking less of yourself. It's think, not thinking of yourself at all. It's like, kind of lay that down. God's got that. You think of others. That's what he's calling them to do. He's saying, don't think of them better. Think of them more. Think of them higher. Think of them above. Uh, the word actually is the word uh, hooper echo, hooper echo, which means hyper, to have higher, to have higher. That's more about them than about you is what it's getting to. It's hard to take the Greek and really express it, but I'm trying to give you all these words so you can see when you read it again, esteem others more than you esteem yourself. It's a better way of reading it rather than better. It's not about better. It's about have them in regard, higher regard than yourself. Let not every man, uh, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. See, that's a, that's a repeat of the same call. He's saying, you're going to think about you. I mean, if you stub your toe, you're going to grab your foot. You know, I mean, you're, you're worried about your foot. What about their foot? What about their toe? <laughs> you know, he says, just realize you need to think about them also. And that's where he puts it. But think about them. And when everything's good with you, forget about you. God's got you. You know, praying this morning, I was thinking about someone who's going through a lot of hard things. And I'm like, I just don't understand it. And the more I thought about it, the more I wanted to pray for them again and more. And I just don't understand when people struggle or hurt or, or are hurt or called to that kind of thing. But it's there. And it's, it's like it makes you want to just weep inside because if it were you, 24 hours a day, man. And, and I think because of the extreme that I'm kind of situation I'm painting for you, you can understand how on the less extreme, that person's hurting who's maybe lashing at somebody else. If we take Yodia and Syntyche in chapter 4. These people may not be in pain physically, but they're spiritually going to be some problems. And he's going to actually call the whole church to come together and help them. But he says, look, not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. He says, let this mind, and that's, he's saying this mind, the one I just talked about is one I'm going to articulate. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now, the mind Jesus had, <laughs> we can't even plumb any near, anywhere near the depths of this, but let me just show you some things that are going to happen here. Paul is calling these people to grow up. And we don't like to be called to grow up. I, I, don't, I like, you know, uh, Toys R Us kids, right? You know, I don't want to grow up. That's the way it is. And, and because we have so many toys, it's like the only difference between men and boys is the cost of their toys. You know, they talk about that. But women have their toys too. It's like the, we all have them. It's, whether it's chocolate. Can I get an amen from a woman you say? Why not? Anybody like chocolate? Nobody likes chocolate. Chocolate or whatever. But Kenny likes you like chocolate? Yeah, well, you can catch me in that. Bring it, right? So now he's preaching. Now he's preaching. Everybody woke right up, see? But my point is, is that we all have that desire to be, be uh, coddled, comfortable. The princess and the pea. Remember that? One little pea was put underneath the bed, and the girl couldn't get comfortable. Had it all going on. So I just want to hear what you're saying. But anyway, it is one of those things where you realize that we're all like that. But he says, forget about you like Jesus forgot about himself. He says, listen, he was the one that was clearly the one who thought of others. He was the one who clearly esteemed others as more important in this situation. You know, the Bible says he despised the shame, but he took it. Why? For the joy. So he's saying those things are things that Jesus did, but he goes into specifics. In fact, it's probably a song of the day where they would say, he was in the form of God, and he thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a. Uh, took, he was made of no reputation, and took upon himself a, uh, the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion, as a man, he humbled himself. Humbled, humbled, humble. He he condescended, and it's like he went lower and lower and lower. How low do I need to go to get somebody else to really get a clue that Jesus loves? Or that God understands them. 
And God wants them to have more joy rather than more strife and vain glory. This is hard stuff. You read the book of Proverbs, faithful are the wounds of a friend, deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. You read the book of Galatians at the end where it says, you know, you, you are overtaken in a fault, you know, you, you are a spiritual restore, restore somebody who's overtaken in a fault. These are hard things. But Jesus did that. And you know how he broke it to us that we were sinners? Little by little. But then all of a sudden, he divested himself of his clothes, of his dignity, put his hands on the cross and he let them drive nails in there. And what I want you to know is Paul says, do you want to know how this looks? Look at the cross. You want to know how this looks? There's no strife. He says, there's, there's, there's no strife. There's no vain glory. Jesus didn't say applaud me. He said, come unto me. I'll give you rest. I'll take care of you. It's like a mother putting the child behind her back when there's danger. Jesus said, I'll take care of you. I'm going to take care of you. And we don't want to be the one who kind of questions that to the point where we mess up the picture. I often liken it to uh, muddying the water. People can't see Jesus if we're a mess. And so we want to make sure we're not a mess so that they can see Jesus clearly. He's going to point out Jesus' example. And that's the first one. Then he's going to say his own example. He's going to say, I was a person. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to lay down my life for you. Uh, you'll see him saying that when he says in verse 17, Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I join. So he says, I'll, I'll lay down my life. See how he's doing? He says, Jesus, hey, you want to know how this looks? Look at Jesus. He says, I'm willing. I'll go. You want to go? I'll go. And then he says, what about this? In verse 19, he says, I trust to send Timothy to you. For I have no one like him who will naturally care for your state. For all men seek their own and not the things of Christ's, in verse 21. Isn't that interesting? He's saying, listen, I want you to get along. I want you to consider what it is that you have been given, in verse 1. He says, the comfort, the consolation, the fellowship, all those things. He says, those are the things that matter. Those are the things that are real. Let them, let you go deeper and make you grow up and begin to have one mind as a body of Christ and a body of Christians. And he says, I'm going to give you Jesus as an example. I'm going to give you me as an example. I'm going to give you Timothy as an example. And if you go all the way to the end, he says, I want to talk to you about this uh, man named Epaphroditus, verse 25. I suppose it's necessary to send to you Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus was probably the pastor of the Philippians. But when he was with Paul with the care package, he got sick and almost died. He said, this man is worthy of honor. Here's people who are really stellar examples. I don't know how many real examples you have in Christ, but you ought to try to find a few. And they're hard to find because, as he said, all men seek their own and not the things that are Christ. It's not easy. I'm not going to lie to you. You know, you look around, you're going to find people that you, there's, a, there's a, maybe an element or an attribute or some characteristic you really admire, but I mean the whole package is hard to come up with, but I'll tell you what, nobody can question Paul, nobody can question Jesus, nobody can question Paul, right? These are clear, powerful examples, and those people in this world that remind you of Jesus more um, are people you want to kind of try to emulate. As Paul says, follow me, mimic I, me, mimic me as I follow Christ, as I mimic Christ. And so I want to end here by just saying this. At the outset of this chapter, he was telling them, you've got a lot in the game. You've got a lot invested here. Jesus has shown up in your life. He's blessed you. He's encouraged you. And you don't want to mess up that fragile relationship by some petty little thing that's in your heart that you're saying, I need to get my right here. I need to get my due. I need justice. And forgetting all about mercy and compassion. And so as you see this passage unfold, that's where it starts. And I'm going to leave it there so we can talk about the kenosis next time. All right, so things to ponder, right? God wants us to be at peace, and the only way to be at peace is to be in unity. And the body of Christ is important. That's another thing you can take away from this. Because you can't do this alone. <laughs> you got to be in a relationship with a local church, other Christians who are also committed to the same body of truth in order to be of one mind. And that's when the church really shines. I think the devil's done a pretty good job of separating us and dividing and conquering. And right now we're in the midst of a crisis that's making us divide by law 
we have to divide. And I think that's tragic. But, uh, but not insurmountable. God's good.